Welcome. It's History Tea Time Chat Live. How is everybody for History Tea Time Chat Live? So today we have two anniversaries that um, fall in this week that I'm going to use to have a little chat. Um, we have the execution of Archbishop Cranmer. He was burned at the stake in Oxford. And we are coming up to the anniversary of the death of Elizabeth I and the end of the Tudor era. So I thought we'd have a look at her last few days. Um, so there we go. That's what we're going to be covering today. So I hope you're all well. Um, I'm streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Hello, welcome if you're joining me live. Thank you so much for, for doing so. Um, let me know if you can hear me okay. That would be great if you give me a bit of a thumbs up. Let me know where you're watching from as well. Um, that would be nice to know. So Yep, like, uh, streaming live, like I say, but if you're in the catch-up crew and you're watching this back later or you're listening on the podcast, hello to you too. Thank you for, for catching up. Um, remember, as always, you can support me with badges on YouTube and uh, Super Chats, sorry, excuse me, badges on Instagram, Super Chats on YouTube, stars on Facebook, and I can show you exactly what it helps me um, do. Uh, I have my little tech kit now that I have um, used your contributions so far, your donations so far to get. Um, Tim says I'm sounding great. Well, that's good because this is what this is. Um, I'm using my road mic on Instagram and this is exactly what your donations have uh, helped me to buy. So thank you so much. So I really appreciate badges on Instagram and you get different colored hearts and all sorts of stuff, stars on Facebook and uh and uh, super chats on YouTube. Good morning, Sherry over there in Virginia and Linda in Michigan. Hi, how are you doing? Not uh, long time no see. Uh, Linda was uh, Linda's part of my Patreon, and we had a book club meeting on Sunday night, so that was all fabulous. Taking tea from Catherine. Hello, she's in New York. Uh, who have we got on Instagram? Uh, David is over there in Chicago. Can hear me great. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much. Um, AG Mommy of Two in North Carolina, welcome. Oh, Concept, uh, Concept RC is on in the Canary Islands. Nice. Graham is down in Adelaide in Australia. Uh, uh, Jenna is, uh, <laughs> she's over there in the US and it's not raining. Woohoo! It's also not raining here today. It's a sunny day. Unfortunately, I'm stuck inside. Erin is in Tanzania. Um, Amy. Is it true she died standing up? I'm presuming we're talking about Elizabeth there. I will come to that. We will definitely talk about that. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for popping comments. Um, Ginsak is in Kentucky. Uh, Doza is in El Paso, Texas. Thank you, everybody. Sorry if I've missed um, people. I try and pick up on as many comments as I can. Excuse me if I sneeze. I've... Um, unfortunately developed an allergy to my dogs which is pretty gutting um and it means I sort of have this constant feeling like I need to sneeze so I will excuse myself uh, in advance if I do so I'm so sorry about that so <laughs> but on to today so yes yeah, so we're going to talk about the last few days of um Elizabeth the first life hello Rebecca that's okay just a few minutes is better than none thank you so much for for, for coming at all Rebecca in Atlanta um Mayfair Forest which hi how are you doing glamorous as always thank you very much yeah I've curled my hair you want to see what it looks like when I don't do it um <laughs> how I get ready for my audience well if, you, if you've never if you've noticed tea time live and History After Dark take place on the same day and that is very much on purpose that I only have to get ready one day a week. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, Heidi in the Netherlands, gloomy but dry. <sighs> yeah, we'll take the rough with the smooth but we want some sunshine. Rebecca in Atlanta, hi. Um, oh, thank you, Jinsak. Yes, my the neckline of my top it's one of my favorites um yeah Rebecca the allergy it's not good is it and you love your you love your dogs and um you develop an allergy to them or it's their dust but the problem is I can't be the one to brush them and get them clean because then that sets it off ah oh, awful never mind I will uh just have to take lots of antihistamine 
uh, sorry, where was I? So, um, uh, Claudia, what do I think of Anne Boleyn as a mother? Oh, well, she didn't have very long, did she, to uh, to show. And, and, and she's also a queen, which is a little bit, it's a bit different. She was as hands-on as she could be. Interestingly, of course, we've got um, Tracy Borman's book coming out on the 19th of May about... Uh, about the relationship between Anne and Elizabeth um, and can't wait because Tracy is speaking to our tour group. Um, I do a tour called the Anne Boleyn Tour every May and this May on the 18th, so a day before Tracy's book goes live, uh, is published, um, uh, she's doing a talk to my group and they're getting a copy of the book if they want one as well. So um, that I'm looking forward to that book and maybe, and obviously Tracy will be going into that in more detail. So excuse me, taking a drink. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk about the last few days of Elizabeth the first life and we'll talk about Cranmer as well. Now I forewarned is forearmed and I, um, I decided what I, what I really should do, probably should have done it a long time ago is read um fox's book of martyrs account of the execution of archbishop cranmer thomas cranmer and actually um it is very 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 long if you put it out onto a four paper uh it's 84 pages long so suffice to say i didn't manage to just uh read it all before coming on but um anyway so i've picked out some bits to talk about um debbie says i thought it was common for royalty to not have much to do with the actual raising of their own infants yeah i don't think it it was i mean they have their own court set up their own nursemaids their own um well yeah nurses um matrons uh heidi Watching Wolf Hall after hearing about it here. Love it. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, I enjoy Wolf Hall. Um, hi, Lisa. Uh, yeah, it's just such a big book. I remember reading and I got up to the bit where what happens to Cromwell's daughters happens to Cromwell's daughters and got so upset that I didn't pick the book up again and then watched the film. Um, yeah, was it a film or a series? And... Um, got to that bit or got to just before that bit and thought oh gosh I know what's coming I found it very difficult very difficult to watch um yeah my far forest which yeah you just think you've got a bit of a cold coming and then I've realized that no it is actually linked to when I see the dogs when I give the dogs a hug never mind never mind um just as a um a heads up I was just mentioning there about Tracy coming on the Anne Boleyn tour but it's 100 days yesterday so it's 99 days today until the private life of Anne Boleyn tour now this one I have a few spaces left uh, on if anyone wants to still book uh, bookings close on the 31st of March but we are going to a variety of places outside of the London area so we still will stay at Hever Castle for um for a night we get a hidden tour a hidden Hever tour so this is after hours tour where you get to go much further into the castle than you do if you're on the usual route we're eating in the great hall you know the the table that's normally behind the ropes we actually sit and eat there and um, that's just one part of it of it we are visiting Sudley Castle, Hales Abbey, um, Tewkesbury Abbey Barclay Castle, um, Acton Court, which is open for an entire three weeks a year for the general public. So we are definitely, uh, when I've realised we could fit that in, I've put that in. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh, so oh, and Gloucester Cathedral. Sorry, I knew there was somewhere else. So that is a fabulous um, tour. And we've got Gareth Russell, of course, with us the entire time. Kate McCaffrey is joining us as well uh, while we're at Hever. So a really good tour. So if you are interested in that, check out the website, britishhistorytours.com, um, because bookings for that are closing shortly. Um, right, what have we got here? Oh, no, I'll come back to talking about uh, Book Club later. So yesterday saw the anniversary 
of the execution of um, Archbishop Cranmer. Now, Archbishop Cranmer um, rose to prominence during the reign of Henry VIII. And he did so by, according to uh, the account in Fox's Book of Martyrs, through no ambition, no plan, no um, effort to impress the king for position. It was almost by accident. And so he rose to prominence in the... um, basically because he he was consulted as you might if you had just sat down to have dinner with somebody he was sort of asked his opinion on the king's great matter um and and he was uh asked about this by two of two of henry's sort of commissioners that were in charge of looking at at, the, at this matter, Dr. Fox and uh, Dr. Stephen. And they happened to be staying in the same house. Uh, Cranmer, Cranmer, Cranmer had uh, was staying at the house of a friend escaping plague uh, for a bit. There was the plague was rampant in, um, in, uh, in London. And so they happened to be in the same house, sat down for dinner. And Cranmer sort of said, well, I think, I think you're going about this wrong. You're sort of looking for a legal argument to why um, Henry uh, shouldn't be married to Catherine. But the the answer is, if, if the answer is there, either way, the answer is there in the scriptures. So the right people just need to look at the scriptures. And this doesn't have to be Rome. It doesn't have to be continental religious houses this can all be done here because the answer is in the scripture you just have to look dr fox and dr stephen when they saw henry the eighth said oh well actually by chance we were having dinner with uh, a person called dr cranmer and he thinks we've been going about this all wrong and actually had we been looking at at it this way beforehand we might have had our answer by now by this point we the 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 king and his commissioners are years into trying to decide is there a basis legal as they were looking for for an annulment or a divorce from Catherine of from Henry from Catherine of Aragon so the king's is a uh, prick up. They are, you know, his 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 interest is uh, is is pricked, and he he wants to see Cranmer. Cranmer is not actually very enthusiastic about seeing the king. He asks the commissioners to make excuses on his behalf, and just basically, you know, well, this is this is my idea, and just take it take it forward. Uh, that isn't sufficient for Henry, and he decides he would like. You know, he definitely wants to see. Dr. Cranmer. Um, and, 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 and basically Henry decides he wants to elevate Cranmer. Cranmer ends up being part of a delegation that goes to Rome alongside Hen- um, Anne Boleyn's father. Um, and he's left on the continent to sort of go around some of the houses and discuss this matter the king's great matter. And it's great matter because it's taking so long to get, it's important, but it's also taking so long to be resolved everyone involved is looking for a quicker solution one way or the other henry for his part assures cranmer that whichever way the answer comes he would accept it pretty much that's how i read that bit anyway um which is not what we're led to think or or maybe what henry wasn't being true to his word there anyway um that yeah, whichever message, whichever whatever the scriptures actually said, then he would abide by. And you know, his queen is the, the the most loveliest queen, the most loyal queen, the most wonderful queen he could have hoped for. And if the scriptures say it's 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 a, it's fine, then then he'll continue to be married to her. Don't think he. It sounds a little disingenuous. Um, 
as we know what happens next. So, um, so yeah, so Cranmer is called for. The king is very interested in what Cranmer has to say, and um, and uh, and he and he so he 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 basically is employed by by the king therefore and ends up going to Rome like I say and ends up staying on the continent now um at some point during this the art the 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 incumbent archbishop dies so there's a vacancy and Cranmer is very much of the belief that you don't need to look to Rome that that there's nothing in the scriptures that says that the pope of that the bishop of Rome the pope is any more is any higher up um, than than a king or another bishop? There's nothing he can't see where it says that the bishop of Rome has any precedence over any anyone else. Um, this, of course, aligns with Henry's um, understanding now of his position as head of the church in England of. Um, his position as the only intermediary required between his people and God. Um, anyway, suffice to say, Cranmer gets the appointment as Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, so immediately, so he's gone from having a meal with some people he'd not met before, putting his opinion across, uh, and within sort of a few short years he is archbishop of canterbury with the highest uh, positions in the country um so he presides over the um divorce of catherine and henry this allows of course henry to marry anne boleyn through that divorce to catherine of aragon mary is um it, it becomes um well she, she i was going to say she becomes um delegitimized so she is uh so her, her parents marriage is annulled she therefore is um is is no longer legitimate she's referred to now as the lady mary not the princess mary um and her little sister born to anne boleyn is a princess and she's one of her 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 ladies in waiting all very humiliating for the teenager. Cranmer has a big role in this. So Cranmer's, Cranmer's position, though, for the moment is secure. It's secure into the reign of Henry VIII's son, Edward VI. Um, and there is an account in, uh, in, in Fox's Book of Martyrs in this, basically a biography of of Cranmer um which um basically says that he he fought for um for Mary at a time where Mary was seen as such a threat by Edward the Sixth's um council and um knowing that Edward is sort of in ill health and he's 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 probably not got long for the world that they wanted to execute Mary and he actually sticks up for her and says no you, you can't do that um but um but anyway that that's sort of just whether that's true or whether that's because of course you've got to remember the context of fox's book of martyrs is that is everyone in there is a a religious martyr um so whether that's true or not i don't know i'd have to do more reading mm. excuse me um so uh, so of course Edward VI though does die. Cranmer, Archbishop Cranmer, is um, a proponent of Lady Jane Grey coming to the throne. That was Edward's wishes. Of course, it aligns with um, with Cranmer's um, beliefs of position himself. Uh, he doesn't believe that anyone should look to the Pope outside of the country. It's a foreign power. Why? Why? And like I said earlier, there's no actual thing in the scriptures that says the Bishop of Rome should be the one to be looked um, toward from anywhere else. Um, so Mary comes to the throne, though, of course, and she wants to take the country back to Rome, wants to be answerable and come under the Pope once again. 
Now, there were plenty of people who held Cranmer's position, of course, in during the reign of Henry VIII into the reign of Edward VI. Of course they did. <laughs> That's how they survived. Um, now, a lot of people just got to pay a fine. They were forgiven. Um, but Mary seemed to be making an exception for the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Cranmer. There is, uh, again, uh, in in the account that that actually to begin with what she wanted to uh to do was to um just strip him of his archbishopric and fine him um but for some reason that did not end up being being the case um now Cramer was uh, arrested he was taken to the tower of London, and then he was um, he was uh, taken to Oxford, and there was this lengthy um, trial um, where he was accused of basically heresy. So, so many people had um, it had been put forward that they should be tried for treason. He was put forward as a, for a, a heresy trial, and so these were things he couldn't deny that he, um, you know, that he had. Uh, uh, that he had um, uh, decided that or fought for the argument that the Pope was not who you should look to um, and that, that he had put Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, at the head of the church and broke with Rome. These are not actually things that he could um, could deny, of course, and now they had become a crime, where they weren't a crime when he did them. Um which is uh, actually pretty much time old uh, way of getting your enemies, you know, <laughs> like just make what they did a crime, and then and then you can get them. Um, so be careful for whoever is in power decides what is right and what is wrong. Um, so so the trial is is lengthy. Now, famously, Cranmer. Um, renounces his faith and 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 converts to catholicism in some way um now it says in in the account that it might be supposed that it was done for the hope of life and better days to come but as we may since per, uh, perceive by the letter of his sent uh, of his sent to a lawyer the way it's written by the way i find really difficult to uh, to read you sort of have to um translate it a bit uh the most cause why he desired his time to be delayed was that he would make an end um so uh it, basically that he was buying time as opposed to his conversion being for uh, uh any i any wish for or belief that he would get um a, a, um freed I suppose so. It's more for a stay of execution um, than, um, than 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 for anything else. And actually, he the Pope wanted him to go to Rome. He was called to Rome to answer for his so-called crimes there, and he wasn't taken. He um, uh, he was kept in England. He was kept at Oxford, and doesn't really appear like there was any intention by the English that he was going to go to Rome uh, now he says um, I mean it is lengthy so I'm not going to read it all but he says things like um, I do renounce a bore and detest all manner of heresies and errors of Luther um, all teachings which may be contrary to the sound and true doctrine i.e., the original Catholic, uh, Catholic doctrine um, I believe most constantly in my heart and with my mouth, I confess one holy and Catholic church visible without which there is no salvation. And therefore I acknowledge the Bishop of Rome to be supreme head in earth, whom I acknowledge to be the highest Pope uh, Bishop, excuse me, and Pope and Christ's vicar and to whom all Christian people ought to be subject. 
Oh, thank you, Belle, for the badges. Justine, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate um, anyone who wants to support me. Like I say on Instagram, you can do what Belle's just done, buy me some badges or on um, Facebook, the stars and on uh, YouTube, the super chats. So it's much, much longer than that. Um, as, uh, supposed conversion to back to Catholicism where he is uh, saying, actually, actually, there is only one true doctrine and everyone should be answerable to the Pope. The Pope is the highest um, uh, representative of God on earth. Um, the English authorities want to make the most of this and they um, they decide that the, what they're going to do is get him to, um, to, 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 to say this publicly before his execution. Um, and this is going to be brilliant for PR. This is going to be great for the PR of, the, of Mary's regime and the Catholic Church. It's incredibly short-sighted. Um, I think Mary, she, she, Mary comes across... With Cranmer's, so Cranmer has uh, converted to Catholicism. That should have meant that he isn't executed. Whether his, uh, whether Cranmer's involvement in the direct involvement in the divorce of her parents had anything to do with it, I suspect probably a lot. Um, but it starts to come across as vindictive and um i suppose you could say evil that might not be the right word in the in the in the context of talking about a sort of heresy trial but you know mary's actions come across as personal when they're trying to put across put put it at put it over as you know it, it, this is a this is a trial uh, uh, of somebody who's who's acted against god but it's coming across in its um in reality, as if it's a trial against some uh, against someone who has wronged Mary herself. Um, so, so again, there's there's a lengthy account of it in Fox's Book of Martyrs, where he where Cranmer gets Cranmer. I keep saying Cranmer. Cranmer gets to speak for quite a long time. If this is uh, if this is true, now he ends it though. Let me find let me find it please um are oh, my masters uh, do not you take it so always since i lived hitherto i have been a hater of falsehood and a lover of simplicity and never before this time have i dissembled um he begins to cry um he, he basically is taking back what he said so he's he's taking back He's recanting on his um, conversion. He's not, once this becomes clear what he's doing, he's not allowed to speak. Um, cries go up, stop the heretic's mouth, take him and take him away, at which point Cramer is pulled down from the stage um, and led to, to the fire. Um Go along the way. He, he's he's got his arms outstretched. He's, he's touching the hands of people, saying farewell to them, um, and um, yeah, and he is and he is um, he's tied with an iron chain to a stake, um, and and his sentence uh, read out loud. Um, now, famously, he he signed his conversion with his with his hand with his right hand he's right-handed and and he has made a promise that that hand that hand that has sinned is going to be the first to burn so as the fire whips up around him he puts his right hand in the fire to burn first um he stretches out his arm puts his right arm or hand excuse me into the flame which he held so steadfast and immovable um, saying that once with the same hand he wiped his face, that all men might see his hand burned before his body was touched. His body did so abide the burning of the flame with, with 
um, such constancy and steadfastness that standing always in one place without moving his body, he seemed to move no more than the stake to which he was bound. His eyes were lifted up into heaven and oftentimes he repeated his unworthy right hand so long as his voice would suffer him and using often the words of Steve, Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, and you know, this, this, this sort of bravery by, with which he goes to his death um, is of course uh, repeated by by his his admirers and gets him into you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, well, not just that bit, but you know his his entire life um, and and his end is is kind of um, it's become um, I, don't, I don't know it, it's sort of um, very oh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, yeah, I'll have to come back to it. I can't think. So, yeah, Colleen, Mary definitely had a grudge. His hand move had to make Mary mad. And this is the thing. It, it backfires on Mary. So Mary and her council have thought, right, we, what we have here is a is a prominent uh, conversion from someone um, who was – he was – Cranmer was at the absolute centre – of the 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 break with Rome, he's the one who 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 came up with the argument or the idea that there's going to be an argument that says that actually Henry doesn't need to answer to Rome at all. He doesn't need to answer to Rome. That allows for the break with Rome. That allows for the divorce of Mary's parents. They've got this high profile conversion back to Catholicism. It's a win for Mary's government, for Mary and Mary's government. And then, of course, he recants it. He takes it back in as public a way as is possible. And that is a massive backfire on Mary and her and her council. Um, and Jenna, as she says, Mary acting out of revenge for everything that had been done to her. Um, Amy, Thomas Cranmer, yet another victim of Henry VIII's ego. Yes, obviously not directly, but Cranmer suffers for doing what Henry VIII had wanted all those years before. So it's a fascinating story. Um, if you want to have a look at the account of Cranmer's life um, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's um, it's online. I will put the link uh, under the YouTube video. So if you want to go and have a look, I'll put that link under the under this uh, this live stream. Um, I'll put the, put the link in the notes after after this. But it is it is a fascinating topic, and like I said, that was, so it was the anniversary of that um, yesterday, twenty first of March. Mm. so and we're going to talk about the death the, the final few weeks of life and the death of of elizabeth the first in a moment as well because we have the anniversary of that on the uh 24th which is friday isn't it um yeah <laughs> claudia Anne had a big ego as well i think i mean if you look into anyone in this period who is involved in these incredibly you know seismic changes to the country to everybody who they are uh uh ruling or in charge of these these people their actions had an impact on every other person in in the country and and maybe further afield as well and yet we do tend to fall into looking at it as a as a rather personal thing, as if they didn't need to discuss uh, or consider the implications on everyone else. Or if they did, it's very much from a point of view of, well, they're in charge because they know best. So, you know, God's talking to them. Their conscience is God talking to them. Uh, so yeah they know best so everyone should just follow them so right now uh yeah so let me i'm going to talk to you about elizabeth in a moment that's it's it's elizabeth the first death is and, and the run-up to her death is fairly 
tragic, actually. But before we do, um, we had our first book club meeting on Sunday. So um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Sorry, Jenna, Henry, without a doubt, caused so many problems for Mary and treated her terribly. However, if Catherine Varrigan had accepted a divorce, which wasn't unheard of for a queen, yeah, which wasn't unheard of for a queen who couldn't provide a, an heir. She could have saved herself and Mary a lot of grief. We've talked about that quite a bit in uh, History After Dark, haven't we? And I do think it's um, it's definitely something to consider. Um, you know, people will disagree and it's fine. That's what, you know, why not? We, let's chat about history and we can do it at a safe distance of 600, 500, 600 years ago. Um, but yeah, exactly, you know, Catherine couldn't produce an heir for Henry. They had one daughter, even one son would have been concerning, you know, to just leave with just one child. Um, a lot is made of the fact that she's a girl. Okay, fair enough. But there was only one child. There was only one legitimate child. Henry possibly had the option of, and, and seem to be making moves towards from a very early point, actually um, putting um, Henry Fitzroy, his illegitimate son in, in some sort of plan, perhaps um, it never transpires that way. And actually Henry Fitzroy Roy dies quite shortly after Anne Boleyn in 1536 Um but she's, yeah, they've got one child. So if Catherine, from such a, a huge dynastic family as well, herself, um, I, I don't know if we've ever got to the bottom of why, of why she was so stubborn in, in her, um, yeah, in her refusal to accept a divorce from Henry, who clearly did need to have more heirs. Whatever we may think, in our 21st century, pretty sure God hope, you know, that our children, um, that we can have one or two and we're going to have one or two still alive when we when we die. That's that's our that's our kind of I'd say hope. But I think most of us kind of take it for granted that that is what's going to pretty much happen. Um I know it doesn't in all cases. They're not that naive in the Tudor world. They're not thinking one child is enough. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with you, Jenna. Um, so, yeah, book club, Bri uh, Brianna book club was a blast. It was so much fun. We spent um, an hour and a half talking about uh, Gareth Russell's book, The Ship of Dreams, The Sink of the Titanic and The End of the Edwardian Era. That was our first book. Um, Sherry couldn't make it, but yes, you've got the replay to watch and you can put your comments underneath the replay um, if you want to add any. So, yeah, so we spent an hour and a half talking about Gareth's book, the the writing style, the information we'd sort of retained from it, what had hit us the most, what, how em what emotions we felt reading the book. Um, all sorts of things. It was it was really, really fun discussion. And we're now on to our second book of book club. So if you're not in book club at the moment and you would like to, um, it comes automatically with uh, a membership of my Patreon. So that's at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash British history. And um yeah, if you if you're a member of my Patreon, basically you are automatically a member of the book club as well. Um, and the second book, then, if you're up for it, and the the next book club meeting is the twenty first of May. They're on Sundays. Um, is this book Blood, Fire, and Gold, which um, some of you will have heard me talk about before? It is Estelle Peronc's uh, dual biography of Catherine de Medici and Elizabeth the First. Uh, with a heavy dose of Mary Queen of Scots, because of course she is tied into both of these women's stories, as they are in each other's. And um, Estelle has a, a a brilliant point of view, um, very interesting point of view, coming from the French side um, in some of her previous work as well, to, 
to looking at Elizabeth, it's it's again, it's another. If you're very interested in Elizabeth, I mean, Catherine de Medici, by the way, very very fascinating figure. But if you're thinking, oh, I probably know as much as I can about Elizabeth. Here is another view of Elizabeth. So this book is well worth a read, um, whether you're in book club or not. But if you are in book club or you would like to be in book club, this is the book we're currently reading. We'll be getting together on Sunday, the 21st of May. I will be fresh off the Anne Boleyn tour and uh, we'll be discussing the book. So uh, you are more than welcome to to join us. So if you, like I say, if you want to be part of book club, then um, then you can um, join at patreon.com forward slash British history. And as well as being a member of book club, you get to put your own questions to historians that I'm interviewing. The last one was about the dissolution of the monasteries, James Clark. Oh my God, finished that um, recording last week. Cannot cannot wait to share it with you i have never been so excited and i've done some incredible interviews including one with estelle Peronk, by the way if you want to watch that as well um like amazing but yeah so you get to answer, ask your questions of um of uh of historians you get an exclusive blog one of which i'm um about to publish which will be on elizabeth's last few days actually um and what else do you get discounts on event tickets so the Georgian Festival this weekend, the Georgians Online History Festival that I'm running, you you automatically get 10% discount on all those event tickets uh, and you get early access to things and you get ad free versions of the content. So uh, Lisa, I'm reading. So, so I just read that as so it's Blood, Fire and Gold, yeah, which shortens to BFG. So the Roald Dahl book, BFG, for a split second. I thought, why is she telling me she's reading the BFG? <laughs> so, yeah, so Lisa's reading uh, Blood, Fire and Gold for the second time. It is, yeah, it's well worth a read a few times. Um, Linda, I've already started reading it. Uh, heard a podcast with author chat. Looking forward to next year. Yes. So, yes, I've, I have a um, an interview with Estelle about this book as well. That's available on YouTube and the podcast so I think it's on the podcast so you can you can listen to that as well if you would like um Beverly I read about Catherine de Medici in the Jean Plady trilogy yeah Lisa loves Jean Plady books so cool um and I must mention just quickly before we go on to Elizabeth's sort of Elizabeth the first story about the Georgians online history festival this weekend. It starts Friday evening uh, through till Sunday evening. There are six talks, Tracy Borman, uh, Gareth Russell, Illyri Lynn, Antonia Keeney, Anne Stott uh, and Katrina Marchant all talking about various uh, incredibly fascinating stories about the Georgian era uh the the tickets are on sale actually until the end of the event they're on sale until sunday because all the talks uh are available until the 31st of may if you have your ticket but ticket sales close on the weekend so if you've got your ticket by then you um obviously you can you can actually catch up on the talks when when you're when you're able to um and the website address to get your tickets for that is www.thegeorgians2023.eventbrite.co.uk. So that's www.thegeorgians2023.eventbrite.co.uk. The link to it is in my Instagram bio. And if you're watching on Facebook and Instagram, you can see it along the ticker tape along the bottom. Um, so there's also two live events on the Sunday. We have a historian panel you can put your own questions to. And then we have a closing quiz, which is a bit of fun. Um, don't worry if you've not watched all the talks by then. They, it's, it's, it's quite fun to, uh, to listen to and uh, test your knowledge anyway. So that's, that's this weekend. So I'd love to see you there. It's going to be, it's going to be loads of fun. Now, let's get on to our last story for the day. Let me have another sip of my water. Mm. I've got the tallest glass ever today. It's, it's bigger than my head. <laughs> Ridiculous. Elizabeth I. It's the anniversary of her death on Friday. 
So she died in 1603. Now, of course, with the death of Elizabeth I comes the end of the Tudor dynasty, the Tudor era. Um, and what I find, well, there's, a, there's quite a lot that's interesting about Elizabeth, of course. But one of the things that we, I think, should acknowledge with Elizabeth, her father, Henry VIII, is criticised for, or could be criticised for being completely obsessed with death. You're not allowed to talk about him dying. You're not allowed to imagine him dying. By the way, that wasn't him who brought that in as a treason, um, as a treasonous offence. That had been in the Treason Act uh, right back from the 14th century. But, but you know, but Henry Henry's very keen that no one talks about his death. But, but he will incessantly talk about his succession to the point where he Henry VIII leaves a will where he is trying to control what happens with the succession for generations after he's dead. For, for multiple generations, he is trying to control what happens. One of the things that's in Henry's will is that the descendants of his sister Margaret, who went up to Scotland to marry uh, James IV of Scotland, that her descendants are excluded from the line of succession. Why? Well, possibly because Scotland had what was called an, the old alliance with France, that they were... Yeah, they had this alliance, this political alliance. If England attacked either, the other would come in on there to support them. So perhaps perhaps that's why. Um, so completes, it completely excludes um, Margaret's descendants. Of course, the prime candidate at the time that, well, for, for, for a while beforehand, but that uh, at the time that Elizabeth is 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 clearly um, coming to the end of her life is James the sixth of Scotland, the son of Mary Queen of Scots, who was the uh, daughter of James the fifth, who was a son of James the fourth, i.e., a descendant of Margaret Tudor, um, who Henry had excluded from the line of succession. Um, so let me just say. Murphy Violets, Henry was incredibly self-obsessed. He was. It also had some part, uh, Jenna, it also had some part to play in the fact that neither of them liked each other. Mary and, uh, sorry, Margaret and Henry. Right, okay. Well, Margaret was only about, um, she wasn't very old when she was sent up to Scotland. So I'm not quite sure how old Henry was um, either. So I don't know. But um Elizabeth, on the other hand, didn't like to talk about death, but would not, would not talk about the succession. And after she, um, I mean, th th clearly, if you have a monarch, it's nothing to do with her being a woman uh, or anything like that. It, there has to be a line of succession. When I mean, Elizabeth is in Henry's will, but it's not really envisaged that, that Elizabeth would, would take the throne. Now, Elizabeth does have legitimate heirs, uh, namely the Grey sisters. So the, they're, they're named in both Henry VIII and Edward VI's will as legitimate successors. Um, but, um, but Elizabeth is so paranoid she's as paranoid as her father in maybe in different ways but she is as paranoid as her father and to name a successor she sees as a shortcut to rebellion to her being uh, ousted off the throne and replaced with somebody else so the gray sisters who are, are hounded Arbella, Arbella Stewart is um, brought to court to be kept an eye on and then sent away from court uh, because all, all by the way all of uh, Elizabeth's legitimate heirs are female as well what she would have done if they were male 
I suppose maybe she would have thought she wouldn't have been queen at all. Don't know. Um, Lisa, I wonder if Elizabeth on her deathbed ever regretted not having children. Yeah. Uh, Beverly, when Edward VI died, the only people able to succeed him were all girls. Yep. Yeah. And even then, uh, they did not have faith in a woman as monarch. So the Protestant faith um, believed that women, uh, yeah, couldn't really rule or if they did they had to rule with the council of men and as soon as say elizabeth had had a son that uh that she could be sort of immediately maybe not immediately we don't know because it didn't happen uh replaced by her by her son so maybe that's in her head as well when she's thinking about marrying and and having children either way she doesn't actually ever, ever name her successor. So let's let's go back a bit. So in Christmas of 1602, Elizabeth is at Whitehall Palace and her her godson, Sir John Harrington of Flushing Toilet fame, uh, he, he invented the Flushing Toilet, uh, he comes to see her at Whitehall Palace and he he's shocked to see that she is she's fairly unwell she's constantly sipping a drink out of a gold cup I don't know if that's um relevant um to, to allow her to speak at all because she has such a sore throat she's also showing some signs at this point of forgetfulness She's she's requesting people come to court and then sending them away because she has no recollection that she has called them at all. So they've turned up without an appointment, despite the fact that actually what happened is she had summoned them. Um, she's also quite depressed. Just the previous, um, uh, was it February, the um, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, stepson of her, you know, favourite um uh, 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 Robert Dudley. <laughs> Sorry, I've got John in my head. Then I was like, "Not John. It's not John." Uh, Robert Dudley. So his stepson, Robert Devereux, um, Earl of Essex, he led a rebellion and he had been executed um, in the spring of 1602. She is incredibly depressed still about that, and with the mention of um, of the situation in Ireland and of um, of the Earl of Essex. Um, she weeps and she beats her chest. This is still incredibly painful um, for her. She's she's heartbroken about the entire thing. Um, now, by mid February, uh, Elizabeth moves to Richmond Palace. Now, Richmond Palace is um, it's 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 demonstrable of the Tudor dynasty. Actually, Henry the Seventh had lived there. Well, it spent a lot of time there from the beginning of his reign. It was a place called Sheen Palace at that point. And um, and he'd spent quite a lot of time there. There'd been a palace there since the mid 14th century. And there'd been a fire when the court had been there. Um, I think it was Christmas 1497, something like that. And he... Uh, he'd taken the opportunity to rebuild and rebuild in uh, in a fashion that he liked. It was in, it was really quite impressive. 14 towers with cupolas on the top. And um, it was his favourite palace. In fact, Henry VII, uh, he, he died there. Um, he renamed it Richmond Palace after the title that he had held when he entered the, the battlefield at Bosworth in August 1485. And this is where Elizabeth, so to Richmond Palace, this is where Elizabeth went um, mid-February 1603. Um, she was still taking meetings there. A Venetian ambassador um, reported that um, that she was showing no, no she, was, she was old, but she wasn't showing any uh, particular signs of ill health. He was incredibly... Uh, impressed by the number of pearls this woman managed to be wearing at any one time so all over her head um 
her bodice wrapped all around her wrists. You know, she's absolutely dripping in, in pearls. Um, and it's quite an interesting or funny in a way exchange that they have. So remembering at Christmas, she's forgetting that she's even asked some people to come to court. She seems to be getting or has back some of that sharp tongued wit that we can associate with Elizabeth because the Venetian ambassador has basically come to her to complain about English piracy, which was happening. <laughs> um, and she chastises him, uh, saying that the Republic of Venice basically only ever come to her when they're, when they're asking for something. Um, now, she even plays the female card, saying that, you know, if, if it wasn't for her sex, would she actually be, you know, would she actually be, um, she says, would... Um, uh, uh, excuse me, she says, my sex has brought me this demerit. In other words, like, would you be saying this if I was a man? Well, there probably would have been, yes, actually. But she, but she, so instead of arguing the point, uh, defending it, she just, she just lays into, lays into the guy with, with her very quick wit. Um, and like I say, quite sharp tongue. Um, so she does that, but only a few days later, so her her hands are starting to swell. These her her long slender hands that she's so proud of for for most of her life are swelling to the point where the coronation ring has to be cut off her finger. Now it was her sister Mary who established this idea of being married to your kingdom. It was Mary who gave a speech, very much like you would expect to come out of Elizabeth's uh, mouth that she was wedded to her kingdom. She gave that speech at Guildhall early, early on in her reign. And Elizabeth, of course, had done the same. So that cutting off of the coronation ring could be seen as an omen that, that her reign is, is in, in the last ebbs. Um, May for first, which sounds like a backhanded compliment to say he was impressed by the amount of pearls he's wearing. Well, maybe I'm putting words into his mouth, but he does notice how many pearls she's wearing. He mentions that she's got a very low cut dress, that she's in uh, white taffeta and gold. She's wearing a crown. Basically, she's cutting a very impressive figure. And you've got this juxtaposition of the grandeur, the, the you know, she, she's wearing this incredible outfit but clearly is a crumbling uh, he, you know old woman her actual personage of the queen is 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 crumbling and he's and he's 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 kind of um he's just really taken by this uh this juxtaposition yeah this 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 look um of kind of crumbling majesty um just it really takes him um so um so yeah so so you so so you have this quick whip but she's clearly she, she's swelling and you have this this cutting off of the um of the coronation ring now the anniversary of robert Devereux's execution comes on the uh, so it's 25th of february and um around that time so she has um she's actually i was saying about her not wanting to talk about the um the succession 40 years beforehand she'd had news that her um cousins had, had married basically now their descendants she hears news again that this is sorry back at the christmas i've got this bit that 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 our bella stewart has approached um, the Earl of Hertford, Edmund, uh, Edward Seymour, excuse me, to marry his son. It, it's almost like a coming together of the, the family line again to, to have this combined um, Tudor, line of Tudor descent. Uh, yeah, put back, to, put back together almost. They could have children and, and the Tudor line would continue, albeit under a different name. Um this floors Elizabeth. Now, Arbella Stewart survives this. 
The Earl of Hertford survives it, by the way, because he's the one who gets a message to Cecil, who is Elizabeth's private secretary. Um, so he just he hears this message and is like, right. And he gets the message straight to Cecil because he has already decided that his best bet is to support the succession of James the Sixth of Scotland to be James the First of England. Um, because all of the Queen's Council are behind it. Um, and that seems to be where the energy is is going toward. So um so around the, the time of Robert Devereux's um anniversary of his execution, she gets Elizabeth gets more letters from Arbella Stewart, who um it seems is well, they're described as melancholy and rambling to the point that Cecil, um uh, Elizabeth's private secretary, secretary concludes that um that Arbella has some strange vapors to her brain. So, in other words, is not her 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 claims are not going to be taken seriously. Arbella is dismissed. Really, she's she's something's going on in her brain, and it, it's it's she's an irrelevance now. Um, however, um, Elizabeth's anxiety and paranoia about the succession that she's had her entire life. We've just we've already talked about that. She's coming to the end of her life. Whether she knows how quick that's coming or not, she um, it's it, it, it's it's on her mind. She's very very worried. She's very very anxious about it, um, and she's worried that everyone around her is looking to who the next successor is going to be. She doesn't eat very much. She um, she's got a very dry mouth and um and and throat Cecil says she's very very dry mouth and throat very hot chest and she's incredibly restless so she spends three days in March uh sort of yeah February early March time walking around the uh the gardens at Richmond Palace in her summer clothes now we're in like this is the anniversary now we're in March now it's not warm (laughs) I can tell you that so so she's having some sort of um issue but yeah she's restless she's hot um people are starting to turn their thoughts to what will happen when elizabeth dies and this is everywhere in the streets in court everywhere um france henry the fourth uh is not happy about the idea of a scottish king becoming the English king, therefore uniting Scotland and England. And that old alliance that I talked about earlier would, by virtue of that, be broken. You've got the king of um, uh, Spain, Philip III, who is willing to back anyone other than James. He sees James as a liar. He sees James as someone who... um, who had promised Catholics that they could have, uh, you know, they could practice their faith and then they couldn't. So he considers him a liar and anti-Catholic. Um, so, sorry, let me see. I've got some comments. Um, Kath watched a um, documentary. Um, they said she had pneumonia um, and a horrible sore on her finger that got infected. There, so there was one sign, outward sign, other than, the restlessness and the heat um a uh, that that Cecil describes a um growth on the underside of her jaw which bursts and gives way to some matter whether that's an abscess because we know she had bad teeth um and struggled with her teeth um i don't know so um so you've got those external potential threats that people are concerned about would France invade um oh Kath just said and her teeth being infected yeah um would uh Spain invade the council actually Elizabeth council were more concerned with a civil uprising the poor are in a bad state by now and they're more worried that there's going to be some kind of civil unrest um Colleen she uh, did she have lead poisoning the um the makeup that they were using i would she must have done 
she must have done. I would have to speak to somebody more medical. Um, but uh, the the makeup that they were using, that she was using to cover up, of course, the smallpox scars, which she um, sustained when she caught smallpox and nearly died, uh, would have would have um, would have caused yeah poisoning. They contain lead. Didn't they contain arsenic as well? Or have I made that up? That's no, it's green, isn't it? It led was for the white. Um, so yes, yeah, so the Queen's Council actually is more concerned with a civil uprising than than a foreign power. But they have been working with James of Scotland for a while, for a long time, to uh, to to make this succession uh, as smooth as possible. Not just because they want to make the succession as smooth as possible, because they, but because they want to make sure that they have position in the new court. Uh, uh, Robert Cecil, the son of William Cecil, of course, is that far removed from the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, which his father was involved in, that he can he can enter into these negotiations unscathed by the fact that England executed. James's mother. Um, so the council are convened at Richmond Palace from the 15th of March. They double the guard, but they're, they're, they're together in continuous council because of this concern that, well, Elizabeth is really, really not well and there might be civil unrest. She's not sleeping. She's getting weaker. Um, and she's refusing to go to bed. She actually refuses to sit, to rest at all for quite a while. Eventually, she is um, uh, persuaded to, whether she's persuaded or she just collapses, who knows, on, and sits on cushions on the floor of her bedchamber. Um, and um, she's described as sitting there on these cushions in the middle of her bedchamber with her with her her gaze fixed um, uh, on the floor and her finger in her mouth. It, I don't, is that just a comfort thing? Is that a sign of contemplation, of anxiety? It, what is it? I don't know, but that's how she's described. And her godson, the, the sorry, her kinsman, so the, the youngest go, uh, grandson, excuse me, of Mary Boleyn, sister of, um, of, uh, of obviously her mother Anne Boleyn, he comes to visit her on um, Saturday the 19th of March. Um, his name's Robert Carey, so Robert Carey, and she takes his hand and says, Robin, I am, I'm not well. Um, he describes her as, as being deep into melancholy, she is so sad um, because she is very aware that people are now talking about um, about the succession. They're looking to the next person. Luckily for him and for her, he doesn't realise that he is one of them. Robert Carey has already promised James that he will carry news of the Queen's death to him personally. Um, so that's a Saturday. The following day, Sunday, Elizabeth doesn't go to chapel. She remains on her cushions um, and she refuses to move for another two days and two nights. And then finally on the evening of the 23rd of March, she is um, moved into her bed. She's still not named a successor. So, um, and like I said at the, the, the beginning, he Henry VIII's will actually at this point is extant. It's still in, uh, it's still legally binding. It, it's still the one that that is is the one to look to. She's not made one. Um, and this, of course, Henry VIII's will bars the descendants of Margaret Tudor, of which James, of course, is one. Um, and the council, so the council have to do something because they've already decided that James is going to be the next king. Um, so they've got this obstacle to overcome and they convene in the Queen's bedchamber 
And so the story goes, I'm going to read out a uh, list of successes and uh, could you please <laughs> lift your finger to, because uh, she's, she's beyond speech by this point, or she's having real trouble speaking. Could you raise your finger to uh, indicate your assent to to one of the names? Therefore, what happens next? Well, sorry, the accounts of what happens next are as varied from she doesn't move a muscle for any name through to when James's name is said, she makes the, uh, she, she circles her, her finger above her head as if to indicate a crown. One of the servants of the court um, aptly, accurately describes the fact that, uh, or uh, summarizes, summarizes the point as well, it doesn't really matter what happened <laughs> because the truth it was not going to get in the way of uh, the fact the council had already made their decision. So the assent is supposed to have been given by Elizabeth for James to be her successor. And um, once that's done, that's her last formal duty. Then her Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, goes in with her chaplains and they pray with her. Once they leave, she is left with just her ladies of the bedchamber. Um, and in the early hours of the 24th of March, she's still with them when she when she dies. Um, so it's, um, I think it's really inc incredibly, if you think about it, poignant story, this, this, you know, she, she comes to the throne as a 25 year old woman. Everyone's very excited. She loves dancing. She's gorgeous. She, um, she could, um, she, she had the, you know, she had the pick of, uh, eligible bachelors, um, and here she is really at the end, dying incredibly paranoid and pretty much a alone. Um, Colleen, do we know if she was given anything for her pain? Uh, not in the accounts I've read, actually. I, so if her. Yeah, there's there's I haven't read and maybe I just haven't read the right thing. Um, whether her doctors were, her doctors surely were called for um, what kind of pain relief they might give. Therefore, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because she she was saying she had a uh, sort of throat and um, or throat pain, but she just wanted to sip on a drink to um, to try and help that. Um, and then if there's um, a, a great book by Simon Thurley which is about the beginning of the Stuart um, dynasty. And his first chapter is great because it describes, uh, it describes basically um, uh, how James ascends the throne of England um, and how he makes his way down from Scotland in a rather leisurely place. He really enjoys seeing all his new castles and houses and, <laughs> and being sucked up to by uh, Elizabeth's ex-council who are now desperate to get a place at the new court because he does bring his own with him. He brings a lot of Scottish um, advisors and courtiers and servants with him. So, but that's, that's another story for another day. But if you do want to, um, to read about that, yes, yeah, Simon Thurley's book, which I can't remember the name of at the moment, comes after Houses of Power, which is about the Tudor built world. And it's the next one. Palaces of Revolution? Not sure. Look at it. Thank you, Philip. Liking my hair. Thank you very much. Well, we've done an hour and a quarter today. That was that was longer than I meant to. Thank you for sticking with me. If you uh, are around tonight, we've got History After Dark at quarter past eight. We're talking about King John tonight. Because, of course, we're in our Deceased Git ser uh, series for 2023, where we look at some of the most dastardly uh, characters from British history. And, uh, yeah, so tonight is King John. So I'll be here again on Instagram and YouTube on the History After Dark channels uh, with um, with uh, Katrina Marchant and Catherine Brooks. And we'll be talking about King John. Um so uh 
Sorry, Linda says, I read somewhere that after she died, her ring was dropped from a window to a rider to take to James. So it was actually a ring of her, one of her ladies um, that was, uh, was she the sister of Robert Carey? Um, that is the ring that was taken by him to, um, to, to, to John, uh, James, excuse me. Um, Mayfair Forest, which if lying down, sorry, just, uh, if, Lying down was making throat pain worse and it could be really bad um, case of reflux. Yeah, I think she was just generally on her way out. Yep, Kath, ear, ear pods at the ready for tonight um, for History After Dark. Um, Colleen's wishing everyone a good day. So, Lisa, yeah, John was such a git. Oh, you wait. We're going to enjoy tonight. We're going to enjoy tonight. And if you can't make tonight... I hope to see you at the Georgians Online History Festival. That's going to be such fun this weekend. And if you can't make that, then I will see you this time next week in the same place. All right then, everybody, have a great day. And hopefully I will see you later, if not on the weekend, and if not that, next week.